Yeah.
in 2011 and his focus then was on uh, looking at how communities, uh, aquatic communities and uh, lakes uh, close to Georgian Bay were responding after decades of uh, acidic deposition. Uh, after that, he went to the University of California at uh, Santa Barbara and uh, worked on Lake Baikal uh, some distance away. Um, and after that, uh, shortly after that, he was hired at Gloria. So today he's going to, uh, he's joined us and fortunately he's added to our critical mass of northern researchers with a, 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 an interesting research program, again, looking at uh, how aquatic systems rebound from uh, different types of uh, anthropogenic influences and of course climate change falls into that and forest fires. So today he's looking at uh, aquatic structures and lakes, I believe, tied into forest fires probably primarily back in uh, 2014. So, Derek, thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the invitation from the ECR to come and speak to you guys. Um, it's a little bit weird because I think you probably have seen some of this in one form or another. You know, as with most props, we don't really do our own research anymore. We 
and other grad students do it and you contribute to it. So you'll probably get my, you'll see my take on what the grad students have been doing for the last three years since I started at Gloria. And as the title says, we'll kind of be talking about two different projects. One looking at how permafrosta influences uh, lakes and the vertebrates, the important parts of the food web in those lakes up north, and then also looking at how fires uh, can impact the environment. So I usually like to start off the presentations um, convincing anybody who doesn't, uh, who isn't convinced that climate change is a real thing that's happening. You know, if you get into the media and you read articles, it can sometimes start to remember this. Uh, so I always like to put up these figures, just showing how anomalous the current conditions are um, and what we think is going to happen going forward. So this figure up on the left here, the, these all three panels, these are data from NASA and the states. The left shows CO2 levels uh, through time, through hundreds of thousands of years of Earth's history. And you know, one of the um, criticisms of, I guess we'll call them climate deniers, is they'll say that CO2 naturally cycles throughout Earth's history. And that is really true. You can see these ups and downs and peaks in the CO2 levels. These are interglacial periods of Earth's history, but it was enormous. But if you fast forward to today, you can see that our current CO2 levels, I just looked before we came in here in the uh, Mount Aloha Observatory in, in Hawaii, shows 413.47 parts per million today. And so that is much above, you know, usually it's been fluctuating around the 260 level. You know, for most of this history, that's as well as high as it can get. So we're really above what you would expect in the natural cycles. And so these were. This is reconstructed from ice cores. You're probably wondering how did we measure CO2 hundreds of thousands of years ago. So there is a big difference here. The second thing is if we look at um, temperatures on Earth, and I don't think I need to tell anybody that temperatures have been increasing. This shows temperature anomalies. So this time series here is compared to 1951 to 1980. And if it's above zero, it means that it's warmer than that 1951 to period. It's below zero, it's cooler. This is for the entire globe for the observations we have. So you can see over the last uh, few decades, we're really starting to get above that, that long term average. And if you still the warmest years have all occurred since 2001, so it's pretty hard to deny that things have changed. And then the last part is you probably see news articles all the time about our. Sea ice. This million square kilometers of Arctic sea ice has been declining at a rate of about 4.8% per decade since 1979. So, all this is just to say that we are in an era of environmental change. Uh, conditions are changing on Earth. And for me, as a biologist, I find these physical changes interesting, but for me, it's the living things that really draws most of my interest. And so, Air temperatures are warming, sea ice is declining, permafrost is melting in the north. What are the effects on lakes, on organisms that live in the north? Um, what do we know about what the future looks like for that? And so um, I like these kind of cuddly, furry looking thing, but unfortunately I don't work with these uh, really cuddly guys. I developed a love for uh, these diminutive invertebrates that uh, live in lakes called zooplankton. And zooplankton are important members of the aquatic food web. They're the ones who eat algae, the primary producers of lakes and ponds, and they transfer that algae up to larger invertebrates and fish. So they're really a key component of aquatic food webs. And you can just see from this figure here, they're microscopic. They can collect the sample from the water, look at, a, look at them under a microscope. But their size doesn't really show you how important they are in this food web. So most of my work is focused around looking at how will things like these zooplankton, how will things like mud dwelling vertebrates, um, insect larvae, and other things that are important fish food, how will they respond to changing conditions? So, like I mentioned, I try to divide this into two parts. First, looks at some work done by my students on permafrost law in the Northwest Territories. The second is looking at um, resilience of lakes to wildfires. So, as I mentioned, I don't do much of my own research anymore, so I just want to acknowledge the people who did this. 
Many of you probably recognize Jasmina and Rachel. They were master students who just recently graduated. Uh, so most of this work is theirs. Uh, this is Alyssa from a PhD student from York who also is working on the project. And this is my colleague, uh, Dr. Sabin Sharma, who uh, is collaborating on this project. So what really got me interested in this question of permafrost thaw uh, was I learned this project called the Global Lake Temperature Collaboration. And what we did was we tried to get time series of surface temperatures for lakes across the globe. And in the end, we collected data time series for 250 lakes located around the world. And these lakes contain more than half the world's fresh water. And we looked at patterns. Were these lakes warming? Were they cooling? Were they not changing at all? And as you can see on this map, most of these lakes are warm, this orange color here. And there, however, there are some lakes that are cooling, so it's not uh, all in one direction, but the, the vast majority were warm. And the interesting thing was that they were warming faster than air temperature and faster than the oceans. Well, what was driving these big changes was actually the northern lakes. Northern lakes were warming faster than anywhere on Earth. Um, and the reason or it seemed to be lost on ice cover. They were losing ice earlier every year. This was allowing the upper waters of the lakes and ponds to heat up for a longer period of time to achieve higher temperatures throughout the summer. And so when I was thinking about how quickly these northern lakes were heating up, I started wondering what does that mean for the organisms living in them. The second thing is there have been studies trying to summarize what will be the ultimate impacts of climate change on lakes. And this is a big list of things, and I'm not going to go over them all, but it's just to say that this is a really complex question. Because you're going to have physical changes, things like ice duration and water temperatures, changes in precipitation that influence the connection of the watershed. And at the same time, those changes are going to drive changes in water quality and chemistry we can measure. And the thing I'm looking at typically is this final aspect, the biological. So you think of physical and chemical changes leading to changes in the communities that live in the lakes. So the main takeaway is that climate change will profoundly affect the physical, chemical, and biological properties of lakes. And it's a complex question to figure out how this might influence the biology. Up north, many of you have uh, been up north uh, for your own research, you know that the landscape is undergoing um, important and significant change. And warmer temperatures are leading to, per to permafrost thaw. This is just one obvious uh, result of it. It's called the retrogressive thaw slump. But it's basically this idea that as permafrost thaws, permafrost is ground and open, permanently frozen. You can get the definition of two years between the or something like that. But then much of the permafrost in the north has been uh, frozen since the last ice age. Now that we have warmer temperatures, this permafrost is starting to melt. And that means that overlying layers of the active layer, which melts and freezes annually, starts to subside. You get this collapse of lake shores and river shorelines. And a bunch of an influx of sediments and nutrients and ions into the waterways. So how will biota respond to this? So I became really interested because zooplankton and benthic organisms are really affected by the types of change you expect from the frost thaw. They're sensitive to conductivity and nutrients, which are really important. Um, however, there's been a few studies looking at what that actually will mean for these organisms. Water temperatures and dissolved oxygen levels are important for fish, but there's little re field research done in sampling in small lakes in the north that look at fish. So the idea was to try and come up with some studies that would answer this. We do know a little bit about how fish communities might change in the north, but this was mostly just based on thermal tolerances. This idea that as the lakes warm, some of these warm water species will be able to shift more. So this is from a publication by Paul Chanel, and uh, they looked at some, I just picked out some of the common species they discussed showing how they would change in the future. I'll just point out this one small bass is a warm water species. And they're saying by 2100, some lakes in the Arctic would be suitable. So that is crazy to me that you could actually have small 
grass, that far north. They can see many of the others like walleye, tenfold increase, wake white fish, threefold increase. And so these are again just related to temperature change. They're not considering some of those more complex interactions of climate. I mentioned there's not a lot of studies on how permafrost thaw might affect invertebrates. There's one that has been done on lakes, only one study that I'm aware of. It actually did look at benthic invertebrates, the guys that live on the bottom of lakes and ponds. So here's an example of midge larvae. Here's a sea shrimp or an ostracide. Here's a nematode or a roundworm. So these are the kinds of things we're talking about. And what they did is they, it was a relatively small project. I think they had eight total lakes. But what they did is they sampled those lakes a lot. They did a really good job of quantifying what was in those lakes. And they were able to show that if you looked at the density of individuals in these different <coughs> lakes, they had lakes that were disturbed by permafrost thaw, lakes that were undisturbed. They also looked at the adjacent shore adjacent to the disturbance or the opposite shore. What they found was that if you were in a disturbed lake, you actually found more land invertebrates, higher abundances. And they thought that was because there were more nutrients, there was more calcium in the soil or in the sediment of the lake that would allow for higher abundances. They also looked at how the composition of these things would change. And you can see um, they've got these pie charts, which everybody says they really like to read. But the idea is that they looked at, for example, nematodes, these round worms. And they were pretty rare in undisturbed lakes, but they did really well in disturbed lakes. So there's a bunch of changes you could look at like that. In other words, there, is, there does seem to be some changes in composition and an increase in amount. Okay, so for our project, that was kind of the background we were going in with. And we wanted to know, um, for small lakes in northern, northwest territories, how is permafrost thaw going to affect the bugs that live on the bottom of the lake, the zooplankton that are swimming in the water column, and how will fish communities change in these lakes? So for, uh, for the first three years of have been at we've gone up every summer, and we tried to get a big data set of lakes. So every summer we try to sample something like 25 lakes. And uh, we would sample fish using something called the broad scale monitoring protocol. It's basically you put a gill nets and sit overnight. And there's a design for how many gill nets you put in the lake, et We collected macular vertebrates, the bugs from the bottom of the lakes using pig nets. We collected zooplankton using mesh zooplankton nets. And we did a bunch of uh, water quality measurements with meters, as well as bringing back water to measure things like total phosphorus and calcium. So the idea was just to get a big data set of lakes where we could look at what were the factors affected and driving differences in the meters among those lakes. And so here's just some different uh, pictures from the field. Here's the DNAP that we used to collect macular vertebrates. Here's a Lizzie, one of our Undergrad students was doing some tick net samples there. Uh, here's some fish sampling with gill nets, collecting and identifying and weighing fish. Uh, here's a picture of a student at the Dimitri Suite for a lake, trying to get a, uh, a map at the bottom. You kind of see the tracks for the boat to drive back and forth. Incredibly time consuming uh, things. It's basically like mowing the lawn, back and forth. On the lake. When it's cold, it's kind of easy. Um, but when it's a nice day, you put on your music, you drive your boat around, and it's pretty chill. Uh, so here's a map of the lakes, and you'll notice that. So here's Fort McPherson, here's a new deck, here's Tuckney up uh, This is the Beaufort Sea, the Arctic Ocean up here. And so all of these dots represent lakes, for example. And you can see right away that they follow this white line. These are this is a series of highways up there. The reason being, a big part of this program is sampling fish. It's really hard to carry heavy gill nets and boats and motors and everything else uh, far away from the highway. And even doing it with a helicopter, I'm not sure how, how long you could do it because the nets sit overnight. So you're flying up the lights, setting up the nets, flying back. 
So it becomes very difficult if you want to include that part of the in your study. So we sampled 76 lakes along this highway. For all of them, we did water quality, vertebrates, and we did the tree at bottom of the lakes. The 46 lakes with blue markers, these were fish survey lakes. We also set gill nets and we saw what species of fish. This is just an example of a bottom of the bimetry map we did for one of the lakes. This is a new bit. Um, this is um, what's called Boot Lake. So it kind of looks like a boot right next to uh, Newbic. And you can just see the bottom profile. So the community seemed kind of excited to have those. Some of the management agencies really like having these maps that they can use for, to make management decisions about water withdrawal. So I'm not going to go through these in any detail, but the finished data set allowed us to have a set of lakes that vary many of their characteristics. The depth varied from very shallow to very deep, the surface area from small ponds to larger lakes, conductivity, set depth, which is the water clarity, uh, total phosphorus, total energy. So the idea is we have a gradient of conditions in these lakes after we completed this data set. Remember, our main question was how will water quality change, changes affect backwards vertebrates? So, what we did is we built multiple regression models using the water quality and physical data we had each lake. These ones are for the bugs that live on the bottom. We looked at total abundance, basically how many were there. We looked at the diversity of them, and we looked at the richness. Richness is just how many species they were in these lakes. And these variables are the ones that came out as good predictors for these three measurements of the community. And the R squared values were pretty good, meaning we had a good ability to predict the variation of the set. The ones I've highlighted in blue here, these are variables that are known to be affected by permafrost thaw. So you can see that in each of these models, there's at least a few. And in the case of richness, there's more of them that are affected by permafrost thaw. And so what we did is we uh, we then used these models to predict the future of the lakes. And we looked at community evenness this time, where each species is about equal in abundance. If you have an uneven community, it means one species dominates, and there's very few of the others. So we looked at these three different measures of the community, and again developed models. And the blue highlighted ones, again, these are things that are affected by community. Okay, so how do we know what the future lakes would look like? We developed these nice models and theoretically we could plug values in them to say what the future might look like for total abundance and diversity. What we did is we looked at the literature. There's been a bunch of studies that have looked at how permafrost thaw affects lake chemistry. And so here's just a list of things affected by permafrost thaw direction that they change, the calcium becomes higher than they expect by chemicals, chlorophyllate and climates. So what we did is we developed these different scenarios. We said the high scenario is if you've got a thaw slope on the shore of the lake. And that was based on the literature measurements. How high can these values get? These other scenarios were just intermediate between current conditions. Baseline is what are lakes look like now? Yeah, they have an average of 21.29 milligrams per liter of calcium right now. If we shift this up, what does that mean for these vertebrates? And so here you can see just these are the different scenarios. Here's the current, here's the low, medium, and high scenarios. So if we're going to have a high scenario, this means a retrogressive fossil up on the shoreline. Low and medium might mean that there's permafrost degradation in the basin somewhere. But maybe it's not directly on the shoreline. Maybe it's active later in the day, of sleep in that area. So we looked at total abundance, and this is for the bugs that live on the bottom of the lake. It's predicted to decline by between 1.1 and 1.4 times, which we believe our models are good. Uh, diversity is expected to increase slightly. Richness, it really wasn't expected to be a change. So we see that permafrost thaw could affect abundance possibly and cause some changes in diversity. The changes were more obvious result on 
probably notice his own plankton models that there were more variables affected by permafrost than I did them. And so total abundance is expected to increase substantially from 1.6 and 3.6 times in many different scenarios. This is a change you might see for the different trophic statuses of lakes, meaning if you've got a, a nice clear oligotrophic lake and you start dumping nutrients into it, and it becomes uh, mesotrophic or eutrophic, more green, more algae, you'd expect to see big differences like this in uh, abundance. Diversity is declining to 1.2 1.7 times. This again, this is like something you see if you introduce an invasive species to the lake, spiny water. But pretty significant declines in diversity, as well as declines in humans. So, we, uh, if you believe our models, and you believe the literature about how water quality will change, these are some possible changes you might see in this So, in conclusions, our models indicated that variables affected by permafrost are not work for these organisms. They, back in the communities, might experience decrease in abundance or new. Diversity. Zooplankton, you'll see more changes, increases in abundance, but uh, decreases species diversity. The fish models are the hardest ones. I'm not a fish guy, and I'm uh, letting the PhD student mostly take care of that. So she's still working on developing models, linking these vertebrates and fish, and then trying to project what kind of future it will look like for that stuff. Okay, so that's what we've learned so far about uh, our permafrost uh, project. The next one is a study again that I didn't do, although I did help Tom in the field a few times. Uh, so this is Tom Freddy's work in Master's Studio Line. He's looking at how subarctic lakes respond to wildfires in the Sawtoo. And there's a, another student, Matt Chaney, he's an undergrad honors student. I didn't have a picture of him, so I didn't put it here, but in the audience, if you want to talk to him. Uh, he did some of these old plankton work. I'll talk a bit about this one. Um, so, I'm sure a lot of you would do fire work, you know, but uh, 2014 was the big fire year up in Northwest Territories. 3.5 million hectares, a lot of money spent firefighting. Um, and the big deal is that the future up there looks like an increase in wildfires in terms of the extent burn and the frequency of burns. At least that's what the model seemed to predict. So this was noted as the worst fire season in something like three decades. And because of that, a lot of the landscape burned, we would be able to um, potentially look at how that might affect aquatic habitats. And so, you know, this is not my expertise at all, but looking at um, why would fire frequency increase? First thing I thought is that it's probably just temperatures, maybe temperature and lack of precipitation. There's actually far more interesting than that. There was a uh, study published in 2017. I won't try and pronounce the name of this person, but um, they published an excellent study looking at feedbacks in terms of what was driving increased lightning conditions for fires up north. And what they found was that uh, lightning uh, emissions caused area to be burned more burned area can then lead to further forest expansion, forest we in the north as well as the temperature increases. Believe it or not, vegetation on the ground influences weather in the atmosphere in terms of storminess and, uh, and the ability of lightning uh, to start fires. So it's kind of this positive feedback. And what they were able to show is that there's a relationship between observed lightning strikes uh, in time, so that we were seeing more lightning strikes through time. And they also looked at ignitions through time versus burned area, and they found the relationship through time. And they showed that lightning emissions have increased since 1975, and those 2014 events coincided with record number of lightning emissions. So, pretty interesting uh, to think about why that, why things might change in the future. And if you're an aquatic ecologist like I am, you start to think about what effects will that fire have on the lakes themselves and the things that live in those lakes. And you can see this is a complex web showing that you have a fire that's catching in the lake, that burns the vegetation. That's going to affect that connection between the lake and its watershed. 
suddenly there's all this organic matter that can run into the lake through the precipitation uh, and run off. There's a lack of leaf litter because you burned a lot of the vegetation. Um, all of these organic substances going into the lake are going to influence the bacterial communities and possibly the plankton communities in these lakes. And it could affect the food sources for the invertebrates that live in the lake. Some of them rely on external organic matter from the ecosystems. And of course, these things are food for the fish. So there's an interesting interconnected web of things that could possibly change uh, once a fire goes through the watershed. So we, you know, before we started this, Tom and I looked at some previous studies to show, well, what have previous studies shown about the impacts of fire on lakes? This study by uh, Kerrigan uh, was in Boreal Shield Lakes in Quebec, and they looked at water quality. So here's nutrients, total phosphorus, total nitrogen, EOC, calcium, and magnesium. And they looked at reference lakes that weren't burned. They looked at some lakes that were logged. And then they looked at bird lakes, which is more important for our uh, current discussion. But what they found is that uh, higher concentrations of total phosphorus in burn lakes, two to three fold. They found higher total nitrogen, about two fold. So you can see the bird is the hatched one, and the reference is the white one. Higher DOC, higher calcium, higher magnesium. And if you're an invertebrate, these things are crucial factors in explaining your. It's kind of interesting. There has been one study, again, this is in Quebec, uh, by I think a big group of the same authors, and they looked at zooplankton, guys that I'm really interested in. And they looked at um, the biomass. So they collected samples, they dried them out, and they tried to see do fires or logging have an effect on the biomass in these different groups of zooplankton. So they looked across all zooplankton. And they also broke it down by different groups, copepods and glossaries and other groups. And they, they put them through a series of series and weighed them and tried to come up with this. And you can see that burn lakes do appear to have higher biomass out of zooplankton and of certain groups than on burn lakes. This is another study in 2002. They looked at uh, differences in richness and diversity of zooplankton between those three categories. The same research group again. Um, unfortunately, or unfortunately, they didn't see any differences in the number of species after bird or in the diversity. And then finally, there has been a study looking at how bugs in the lake, in the lake are affected. This is by Scrimmager and Al. They looked at, this was in the Boreal region of Alberta, and they looked one to two years following a wildfire and they did see significant differences in some groups. So they looked at overall differences, and then they looked at individual groups, such as the midges and the worms, and the scuds and the round worms, and these fingernail worms. And for some of them, like the scuds and the worms, and the bronzes, they did see significant difference, significant increase after lockdowns. Okay, so going in, we were to summarize all that information. We expected short term impacts on water quality. All these studies were done you know, one, two, three years after the fire. Um, we expected short term impact on zooplankton. Again, they were done in short intervals of the fire had run through. It didn't look like it affected richness. So we thought maybe zooplankton abundance might go up, not richness. And we also thought there would be short term impacts on magnet work for abundance based on those studies. But the key thing is most of them have been conducted further south, southern boreal region. And what we wondered is, could there be different responses in the northern boreal forest? Could there be longer lasting responses? So permafrost, fires are known to affect permafrost and increase the depth of the act together. Maybe that's going to have a different effect or a longer effect. Uh, there's shorter growing seasons up there. So does that mean it will take longer for the watershed to recover for the mix to recover? And so we went into this kind of with these questions of does it matter that these lakes are further north to the respondent? And so the key questions is could we still detect water quality differences four years after those fires went through? 
could we detect differences in the bugs or in the zone? And so Tom spent a long time learning GIS and figuring out how to map drainage basins and everything else with these lakes. And in the end, we, we uh, chose 20 lakes to sample over the range of surface areas that had either been affected by fire in 2014 or had not been. So we looked at the Canadian National Fire Database and tried to pick lakes we knew were affected and then control those over that um, These lakes were um, Sample for water quality, things of nutrients, alkalinity in the sea, probes to measure pH to humidity. We had this little boat, we had to access these, these uh, lakes by float plane. So Tom um, would bring this little boat and then deflate it and inflate it, bring it on and off the plane. Uh, but we drive that boat out to see is there uh, what the next lake was. And then there was a lot of GIS work, just looking at watershed area, how many hectares we burned. So, in this, you know, this was in uh, the Sautu region. Went to each of these lakes, three randomly selected locations on each lake. We collected bugs from the bottom, we collected zooplankton from the water column, and we measured water flow. So, here are just some results. So, this is a principal component analysis. Each dot represents a lake. And all these arrows represent water quality characteristics or physical characteristics of the lakes. And usually, uh, what I expected to see is all the fire lakes would group all together. Because uh, lake points that are more similar are located closer together on this plot. And this coloring with all of these dots show what we think will be the effect of forest fires. The reason is that we took the number of hectares burned in the watershed and divided it by the lake surface area. So if you have a large watershed with a lot of burn and a small surface area lake, we think we can highly impact it, for example. And so the highest impact lakes should be the red, the orange one on this plot. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, we don't see them move together at all. So this suggests that four years after the fire, we're not really seeing a strong signal in water quality of the fires. It's just a mix. These lakes, these blue ones, were not affected by fires, and they're intermixed with some of these purple and orange and red ones. So they're not nicely grouped out. We also looked at the benthic microvertebrates, the bugs in the lakes, and again, if we thought there was going to be a big impact of fire, we expected all of these dots that are orange or red would move on, on one side of the plot. But instead, again, we just see them all intermixed here. Uh, we did see different communities. There were some communities dominated by scuds, like these gamblers. Some communities dominated by midges, so they were mostly midge communities, and some dominated by mayflies. So there's these three different communities, but they weren't really associated with the fires themselves. This is probably just natural that we could find these lakes. So if we were to look at a community that's dominated by midges versus one that's dominated by scuds, what is driving that? And we thought, well, maybe there's water quality variables related to the fire that are driving these differences. But when we looked at we did something called error. This tells us how important is it at describing the differences in these communities. The big ones were calcium and non-activity, and these are things that aren't related to the fire. It's not related. We also looked at some other measures in the community. We looked at how many species of uh, benthic invertebrates there were in each lake. We looked at the total abundance, we looked at sensitive species. We did that same hierarchical partitioning analysis to see which variables were driving differences among the lakes. And we have them colored here the fire variables. These are variables that might be impacted by forest fires based on our analysis. And so you can see for richness, the most important ones are conductivity and VOC and total phosphorus. And none of those are affected by fires, at least in our estimation. For abundance, the total number of them, there were some variables that were important that are affected by fire. 
but it's all gone still and not with the contents for the next unit. The weird thing about our analysis, or perhaps it's not so weird, is we found that there were long macrophytes, meaning plants, rooted plants, and plants that were affected by fire and movement control. And then for sensitive species, again, the most important variables were not ones um, that were influenced by fire. For zooplankton, it's, this, it's mostly the same thing. However, we do see a few patterns in this plot. So up in this corner, you see most of the orange and red dots. And uh, near this arrow is the daphnia and the microcyclops. These arrows are all close to these orange and red dots. And that means these species were more abundant in fireworks, like that were affected by fires. So here's a daphnia, and here's what a microcyclops means. On the other hand, if you're in a lake not affected by fire, the burn, or the, the blue and the purple ones, you tended to have more calamine plants, longer in time. And there's differences in feeding strategies among them. We're not quite sure what's driving this difference. But these guys are predatory, these guys are filter feeders. And so we're, we're looking into what might possibly drive this kind of one type of community. And the burn lake versus others in the So interesting patterns, but we're not quite sure why that. And we did the same analysis with the zooplankton to look at what's affecting the number of species of zooplankton in each lake. And for richness, macrophyte abundance was the most important variable. And that makes sense because zooplankton tend to use macrophytes as cover for predators. Um, so Important refuge locations in this habitat for some species. So these uh, macrophyte abundance, or the number of rooted plants in the bottom of the lake, are important. Uh, for abundance, it was mostly just variation, natural variation in other factors, unrelated to the climate. Calcium, chlorophyll, and the two. That's most important. Okay, so what do we get from that whole mess of graphs and all that analysis? Um, in the end, Tom and I are still debating, actually. We need to go back and forth on this. But uh, my conclusion so far is that there, there were clear differences in water quality based on the burn history. That yeah, PCA didn't have the dots grouped out of blood. There were clear differences in macro vertebrate communities among the lakes, but some of the variables uh, affected by fires might be important, shown in some of our analysis. The preliminary results suggest that all plankton might be. Differ based on burn history, more daphnia and cyclopatric pots in burn lakes. Um, we still have to explore why that would be the case. Uh, overall, it appears that the lakes are, are relatively resilient in the face of wild, wildfires. So, while the first study was making a big deal about the changes that might happen to come across that, uh, for this study, I'm more thinking that the lakes probably have experienced a long history of. Forest fires are a natural event, and there's probably some type of resilience built in these lakes so that they can recover after a set period of time. Okay, so in the end, like I said, I definitely didn't do this by myself. Uh, talk about the grad students, but there's a lot of organizations, a lot of funding agencies, a lot of local community members uh, up north who helped us uh, collect data and provide input into the project. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Okay, so we have time for some questions. Uh, I'm curious, so when you look at sort of burn areas in these sort of main features, I thought, I mean, is there any way to burn some areas? Is there a difference? Like, I find these are what's right. Um, yeah, Tom's done a bunch of cool stuff with uh, what's called the Google Earth Engine. And there's a way to use this, an NDVI. Yeah, to, to calculate basically burn severity in, in using remotely sensed data. So it's not like ground truth data that would actually be collected, soil or anything like that. But um, I don't know that we found really clear. With that, there's certainly associations with measurements of burn severity in some of the water quality factors. 
But if we didn't find a lot of difference between low and high burns here in terms of which factors came out. So yeah, it's really, we thought about that too, it would be really cool. Um, it might also just be that for most sensitive it isn't as good as if it went with some ground based stable as it has to be. Mentally, uh, the Daphne is a legislative category. Um, what kind of background work they do is very often? The cyclopoids? Yeah, so that's that's why we're thinking what's driving them. And I'm thinking these, uh, these this species of cyclopoid that seem to be really abundant in burn lakes, they're very small, they're called microcyclops for a reason. Um, and I think what they feed mostly on is ovaries. That's one part of the zooplankton we haven't looked at yet. But I have a feeling that maybe rotifers are responding to the water quality changes becoming more abundant, and that's giving those cyclopoids more prey items to feed on. That's a totally unsupported hypothesis, but one that I think we're going to try to address. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's a great point. Tom, Tom's measured just about every possible variable, <laughs> humanly possible, and one of those is the slope of the watersheds. And um, that's come out as an important predictor in any of our analyses. Okay, so it might have, yeah. It was, it was the, the bigger lakes uh, with higher slope. That's usually at the, the bottom of that cliff. Those mm -hmm. have higher calcium because it's not there's more water. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so this is something new to me because I haven't done a lot of that linkage between the watershed and the land. So we were trying different things, but I don't know. Obviously, it's more than just the I've never seen you speak. I don't know what you do. So <laughs> it's nice to see that I know what you do. I like you, and now I know why. So I really like the forecasting stuff. So I'm curious how you got the variability in the forecast. Is that you just did it on the whole data set, or yeah. did you do some kind of propagation of error kind of calculation? No, I think ideally we would do some kind of propagation of error calculation. But what was done was just we had a data set of 70 lakes. And so for each individual lake, we calculate how we would choose to change in that lake. So the bars are the bars are really that variation in response in that lake. So that's why you see like it kind of goes in lockstep as you go up. Um, yeah, I think that's um, I was thinking about that the other day. I think the reason is that the original data set has more outliers in it or something, and then when you Run it through the model and go somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned hectares of bird, you already mentioned uh, virus severity. Can you one last variable, I guess, to consider the distance from the water to the I don't think we ever tried that one. There are these fires that actually. I think the one that the ones that were our fire lakes, it was almost a complete watershed burner. So it's weird, our data set is either nothing or almost complete, complete burn the watershed because of the severity of the fires. So it would be nice to get more of a gradient there, where like half of the watershed is burned or some of it from further away from the lake, like you say, or somewhere on the shore. Yeah, you can imagine like a repairing buffer being left around the lake, and then maybe it would be disaffected by fire that's further out. It may, may help isolate the effect of the outliers. 
Yeah. Yeah, account for some of the very, very intelligent see. Questions? I have I have one. I I've, I've been hanging around a bunch of bunch of accounts uh, for part of my life. And more recently than earlier. But uh, when you look at dissolved organic carbon, you say, I think you said the fire lace, it didn't look like there's any impact on it. And the, the issue that I would see with that is that the DOC changes, its, its chemistry changes through time very quickly sometimes. And certainly under natural drainage versus, say, drainage from a fire, you, the type of DOC that you're getting in the lake will, will change dramatically. So I'm just thinking that. Some of the tools they have now, you might be able to isolate differences in DOC and see if there are differences in you know, fire systems and non fire systems or even permafrost disturbing systems. Okay. Yeah, I probably should have talked to you and Scott before we did yeah. because we could have looked at quality of the DOC. Considering you guys just met, I mean, we just signed it. Yeah, I guess that underlines the fact that Heidner caves a lot. Okay, any further questions for Derek? Okay, well, join me in thanking Derek uh, before we do that. <laughs> this uh, coming Wednesday, we have two talks, uh, one by Adam Schultz uh, in, in the arts, uh, the former business building, um, at 1 o'clock. I don't have a room. Do you have a room over else? Okay. Uh, if you've heard of this guy, he basically is a modern day explorer. He travels all over northern Canada with either a canoe or on his feet. And he's got a PhD in history from McMaster and he makes a lifetime of exploring our country, um, as I mentioned. Um, so he's giving a talk on PM Wednesday. Earlier in the day, we have uh, two lead authors of IPCC reports. Chris Dirksen, who has put out a, a report on cryosphere and oceans. The IPCC and Robert McClellan is in the geography department and environmental studies. Uh, he is uh, with the annotations uh, group and both are the authors uh, for the IPCC reports. He'll be talking at 10 o'clock in 2C16 in the arts building. So we'll put posters up and uh, if you can make it probably well worth attending. So thanks again, Derek, and uh, thank you for. Coming, I've got a book for Derek called Clients of Winter. It's by David Olison. Uh, David is uh, sort of tied into our department a little bit. He and his wife live in the eastern arm of Great Slate Lake and have been there for, I think, 30 years now. In 2014, their house was burned down by the fires that you're studying. And in the last year or so, he's rebuilt that house and uh, they continue to live there. He's a pilot. And if you're looking for a, a fairly uh, quick way of getting into Relatively small lakes. He uh, has two planes, and he's uh, as many thousands of hours of flying in the Northwest Territories. And well worth looking up. Thanks again. Thank you.